This is Talking Foreign Policy, a critical look at Canada's role abroad, and I'm Eve Engler. Uh, we are coming upon Remembrance Day, uh, which is an annual uh, celebration, which is, uh, or commemoration, which is um, uh, very much been tied up to martial patriotism. But by my estimation, Canada has only fought in one morally justifiable war. If you look at Canada's deployments to Sudan in 1884, South Africa in the late 1800s, early 1900s, World War I, Korea in the 1950s, Iraq in the early 90s, Yugoslavia, late 90s, Afghanistan throughout the 2000s, uh, Libya 2011. There is only one war that you could make a case was uh, morally justifiable, which of course is World War II. Uh, and even there, you can uh, make lots of criticisms of some of the policies Canada pursued in the lead up to uh, uh, to that war and that, it, in fact, enabled fascism and, and Hitler. Nonetheless, um, Remembrance Day, uh, which we are coming up to, uh, marks the end of World War One, the 11th hour, 11th month. And um, uh, to discuss Remembrance Day and martial patriotism and some of the good and the bad um, that are tied into this uh, this uh, annual day. We have um, uh, Ian McKay, who is a historian. He is the co-author of The Vimy Trap, or How We Learn to Stop Worrying and Love the Great War. Uh, first of all, thanks for coming on, Talking Foreign Policy. And can you speak a bit about uh, World War I, this what was essentially a senseless imperial, inter-imperial conflict um, that uh, left a huge suffering um, can you talk a bit about what World War One was about and a little bit about how it's become uh, represented in Canadian politics uh, today? Well, thank you very much, Yves, for uh, having me on your uh, show. And uh, I, I thank you for remembering the Vimy Trap, which Jamie Swift and I brought out. And I, I think it was one of the first Canadian attempts to really challenge what we've developed in Canada as the myth of the war the First World War in particular. So you call it a kind of senseless inter-imperial struggle. And I, I think, you know, there's considerable merit to that point of view. It, it was a war between empires. And I'm often uh, struck by how little Canadians actually know about the details of that war. Uh, I'm an historian by trade, so historians can go on and on and on for hours uh, about details that people maybe don't want to go you know, don't want to remember. And in that case, the weeds are really, really thick. But nobody today who knows their history will remember the First World War the way that Remembrance State tells us to remember the First World War, which is as a fight for Canada, a fight for freedom, a fight for basic decency, a fight for Christianity. Uh, all these were uh, myths that essentially got developed after the First World War, which was a fight for empire, a fight for the king, and really a, a fight for Britain, not Canada. So, you know, I'm working now on a, a long, long book about a 19-year-old kid who went off and he died in Passchendaele over the objections of his father, who didn't want him to go to war at all. Um, but when he explains why he's going to war, he says, I'm going to fight for the British Empire. So from his point of view, the British Empire was just the very best thing that had ever happened to humanity. Uh, it was a, you know, the bright, bright beacon of civilization and good values. That's why he went to work. So, I, you know, I'm in a story and I kind of want to get into his mind and respect him and, and understand where he's going. But that doesn't mean I can actually buy into his British imperial framework. And that, to me, in a nutshell, is the problem with how we're remembering war in general, and the First World War in particular, were distorting the past. And, and we should say, dur during World War I, in terms of the, this idea of it being imperial conflict, Canadian soldiers garrisoned parts of the Caribbean, the British colonies in the Caribbean. Canadians uh, fought in Africa. That was kind of the end of the scramble for Africa, and Canadian was in charge of uh, taking over German territories in, in, in West Africa. Um, so this was, you know, really, uh, this, this is not uh, this direct Canadian involvement in the um, colonial imperial structure uh, uh, during uh, during World War One. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, the horrors. And as we were, you were just talking about before we we started. You know, there, there's all these Canadians killed, incredible numbers of um, of Germans that were um, that had uh, surrendered. And there's books about this, and some people even claim that the Canadian troops were actually the worst when it came to uh, to slaughtering. Um, uh Germans uh, that had surrendered can you give us a little bit more about just the degree of the horrors uh in Europe and more generally in during World War one yeah that's a great question Eve the the Canadian sensibility about the first world war is that we were the victims and so the story we often tell is like my young kid from Madaga going off to fight we tell tell the story about this innocent going off and being killed. I think a lot of Canadians, farm boys and, and so on, really didn't know what they were getting into. And the ones who did think about it were often in this British imperial mindset. But when they got there, uh, you're absolutely right that they developed this tendency of really uh, brutalizing German prisoners of war, sometimes shooting them when they were attempting to surrender. Uh, I mean, there's quite a lot of literature now that shows that every major battle the Canadians fought in involved shooting prisoners. Uh, Canadians need to, if we're going to really make a sacred moment of this war, we have to reflect that it was a racially segregated army. Uh, Black Canadians could sign up. They were consigned to a construction brigade. They weren't allowed to be officers. And they were harassed consistently throughout the war. This was a, a very racist empire that people were fighting for. Uh, and if you're looking at the religious dimensions of the war, you'd be amazed at how many Presbyterian, Anglican, and Methodist ministers would give sermons to the effect of, we must slaughter Germans, whether they're men, women, or children, we must wipe them out. So you had this passionate drive to you know, demonize Germans. Uh, I mean, this is where yeah, Kitchener became Kitchener, Ontario became Kitchener, Ontario. It used to be Berlin, right? But there was a, a basically a mob of uh, out of control soldiers in Berlin. They terrorized the Lutheran minister. They went after German clubs. They they made life misery for the Germans there, and they finally prevailed by a narrow margin to make Berlin into Kitchener. So I guess I'm, what I'm saying is that you have to remember uh, the war in its entirety. And once you do that, you're not going to really honestly be able to say this was a, a wonderful crusade for democratic values. Think just for a minute of the sides that we're actually fighting on in the First World War. Okay, the British Empire is not a democracy. And if you, as you pointed out, it, you know, indulged in all kinds of things in the West Indies and, you know, had reached a huge wealth out of India and uh, slave trade. And, you know, the British Empire isn't exactly uh, something that many of us can unreservedly <laughs> respect. Setting that aside, look at the other empires that we're fighting on behalf of in the First World War. For example, Tsarist Russia. Uh, well, is Tsarist Russia in anybody's idea of uh, a democracy? So you're going to get from, you know, the, the mainstream media throughout Remembrance Day, you're going to say, well, they fought for democracy. They fought for our way of life. No, they fought as one component of vast imperial struggle over another a network of empires and non-democracies. There was very little democracy going on in the First World War. Uh, people were kind of promised it as the war proceeded, uh, Woodrow Wilson said, oh, this is a war for democracy. That kind of got the idea going. In, in its inception and in its essence, this was a war between empires. And it's very hard for me, at any rate, to say that one side was morally preferable to the other. I mean, <laughs> I don't, don't want to go on, but look at our Italian allies. <laughs> I mean, there they, they had this wonderful general called General Cadorna, and his uh, approach to discipline in the army was when things went wrong, he would shoot one out of 10 in the army. The, the old Roman tradition of decimation, right? And he took it literally. And, and whether you had done anything wrong or not, you would be hauled off and shot. Uh, 
that doesn't really sound like a democracy to me. <laughs> that sounds like a tyranny. Uh, and that's so typical of how we treat the war. We wanted a simple, We when we're looking back, we want a simple black and white moral struggle. And that's not what we're going to get. Right. Look at Vimy Ridge. First time that poison gas was inserted into an official battle plan in a war. Should we really be revering Vimy Ridge when it basically it's a great moment, a breakthrough moment for chemical warfare? Uh, to me, it 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 is it is offensive to the spirit of history to be doing this. So that's part of my very mixed feelings about Remembrance Day. So much of it is based on the First World War, with the Second World War kind of smuggled in as an add-on. And again, I, I find that very uh, objectionable. Because as you say, the first, the Second World War certainly had strong moral reasons why people should go off and fight in it. Uh, it was largely the outcome of the botched negotiations after the First World War. The First World War was the prelude to the Second. Uh, how can you uh, forget that? And how can you wipe, how can you wrap up all of our wars into to one big thing and say, Canadians from really from the mid 19th century before there was even a dominion of Canada to the debacle in Afghanistan, how can you possibly lump all those wars together as one big reverential war for freedom? Well, you can't. Some of them were outright wars of empire uh, that have been blended in to Remembrance Day. So that's that's those are some of my feelings for having a really uh, divided, primarily critical opinion about Remembrance Day. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a couple there's a couple of things. So one thing in terms of I think people do need to know about this sort of to, and bringing Remembrance Day up to today is is that. So the red poppy is copyright of the Royal Canadian Legion. Uh, they were given that, I think, way back in the 1920s, even maybe. They have, um, uh, and and um, the red poppy comes of the a pro war, pro World War One poem uh, by uh, by John McCrae. Uh, so it's all it's all completely intertwined with this militarism and this this the horrors of of, of World War One. Um, and and um, the red poppy is also it, it raises money for the legion and the legion, um, you know, this isn't an organization that's just trying to um, help those who have uh, been harmed by war, which I think most people or almost everyone would would agree upon as a as a good thing. Um, but the Legion has the politics, right? The Legion is, has been a very aggressive proponent of militarism going back many, many decades. It's actually been, been pretty pretty openly racist, less so today. But you go back historically, it's quite um, um, a militaristic kind of organization, very much aligned with, um, uh, with sort of empire, uh, foreign policy and military policy. Um, so yeah, could you talk a little bit about about the Legion, and then maybe also you know sort of how this it, 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 you, you touch on a bit, but it, this it really commemorates Remembrance Day commemorates our victims, but it doesn't commemorate um, those who are victimized by our uh, military. So we don't commemorate the Libyans or the Iraqis or the Afghans who were you know killed in in wars that Canada was involved with. Can you comment a bit about the Legion and, and that kind of more broad uh, uh, point? Sure. The Legion is really a fascinating phenomenon. Jamie Swift and I, when we wrote The Vimy Trap, we got into some of the politics of the Legion. And it's way more interesting than you might imagine. A lot of returned soldiers came back extremely angry at the society that had sent them to war. They had been promised something better, and then over time, it seemed like all those promises just turned to nothing. They were horribly victimized by the war. Uh, so for the first decade and a half after the First World War, there was a radical veterans movement 
And a lot, even in within the Legion, there were these radical pockets in the Legion where people were saying this war was a Holocaust, their own word. Uh, you know, when I used, used to give talks about Vimy, I would, I would often quote all these people saying these very anti-war things. You know, one soldier uh, went to his father and, and his father said, you know, I, if, if this ever happens again, I'll, I'll take my boys behind the barn and shoot them. I don't want them, I don't want them to ever go through what I went through in Europe. The audience would be saying, oh yeah, that's typical anti-war stuff. And I would say, so said so-and-so from Canadian Legion branch, <laughs> this Canadian Legion. There was so much anti-war fervor going on among the veterans, many veterans associations. So there was a huge struggle over the veterans. Where were they going to go politically? And that in the mid 1930s, and when you, is when you really start to see the solidification of this conservative version of Legion, which then has never looked back. But what I would say is, you know, these people were really, really promised something in the First World War that it didn't give them, and there was, you know, many of them turned to the radical left. A lot of people who fought in the Winnipeg General Strike, who fought in the Great Class Wars in Cape Breton. Uh, joined the CCF or the Communist Party. Uh, lots of these people were veterans. And they had drawn certain lessons from the First World War that the system as a whole was determined not to be concluded from the war. That, that the, the, and this, it was a real shift in meaning. Uh, so that goes to the second part of your question around uh, victims of the war. I think a similar change we can see happening with the way we celebrate Remembrance Day or commemorate Remembrance Day. So back in, you know, when I was, uh, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, I can remember Remembrance Days in which we mourned the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We remembered the people who were uh, being blown to bits all around the world. We remembered Vietnam. I'm not saying it was necessarily a very radical position, but at least people were saying war under industrial conditions is a terrible thing <laughs> and imposes huge sufferings on people. From Hiroshima on, we have known that it's it, it has the potential to end human civilization altogether. So there was that, that element in Remembrance Day services back in the 60s and 70s that I think has been almost completely erased since then. And now I would say we have much more of a, a raw, raw, primitive form of nationalism uh, rather than that more generous, compassionate, I would even say Christian point of view in which you're, you're willing to, to say, you're willing to identify the German uh, soldiers we Canadians killed in the First World War as well as the... Uh, Canadian soldiers who died. You're willing to remember people on both sides because this, in an industrial war, gradually the enemy and the 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 enemies and and the and and, and friends blend into each other. Uh, the line between civilian and soldier is erased. So I think you could see in Remembrance Day, at least in some moments, a potential for something like critical reflection that has now been eroded after especially through 40 years of, of right-wing governance, everyone just wants to go for that militaristic meaning of Remembrance Day. And I think it's a terrible shame. Yeah, I mean, you would think a real genuine Remembrance Day would, would be one of the main items this year, uh, would be ending Israel's uh, war and genocide in Gaza. And uh, But of course, it, Canada's political establishment supports that so that gets uh that gets kind of lot lot left aside in the in the remembrance day um uh, uh commemorations in fact <clears throat> the many of the proponents of remembrance day are are actually very aggressive supporters of uh of the Isra Israel's violence uh, um in Gaza can you maybe i guess maybe just to conclude a little bit i know there's like you know there's a white poppy campaign there are sort of there's feminist uh, anti-war uh, sort of 
reinterpretations, let's call it that, of Remembrance Day. Maybe just a little bit about some of that kind of stuff. And um, and yeah, you know, like how do you how do you tease out the genuine um, commemoration of those who've been killed and all the horrors of war with the nationalist uh, celebration of more war? Yeah, and the, the very tricky thing here, Eves, is that uh, Remember Day has become something like a national funeral. Now, this is in English Canada. I don't think it has quite the same resonance in Quebec, the Jure de Souvenir, you know, raises very different kinds of memories, conscription imposed from above on a, a nation that didn't want to undergo it. But I think that you're, many I just make it clear. I just want to make that that's that's referring to conscription during World War One, which led to you know mass opposition in Quebec, which led to even four or five people being killed uh, in Quebec City uh, by English speaking uh, troops uh, in response to those who were hostile to conscription. Yeah, they were shot dead for being in the wrong place at the wrong time at a demonstration against conscription. So they weren't even political militants, not that that would justify them being killed. They, they were bystanders. And then the conscription crisis, when so many Quebecois had to you know, flee from the forces of law and order, can't we make that part of Remembrance Day? A real honest Remembrance Day? Can't we make the Canadian shooting of prisoners, Canadian participation in gas warfare? Can't we make that part of an honest Remembrance Day? Can't we make Passchendaele, the, the slaughterhouse of uh, the, the Finnish slaughterhouse of 1917, can't we make that part of Remembrance Day, uh, a, ma a massacre of about 20,000 Canadians, 16,000 Canadians, I think is the more exact figure, 16,000 Canadians for absolutely no purpose whatsoever. I mean, even the military historians who try and be, you know, hard-nosed and, and gung-ho about the war, when it comes to passion, they say, oh my God, what were they fighting over? You know, swamp, basically. Uh, and you're going to throw Canadian lives into that. Can't we remember that? Can't we have a rational discussion about the pros and cons of the First World War, not to mention all the other wars that have come since? Are we really sure that they were all in defense of democracy and freedom? Well, let's have an honest debate about it. But the funereal atmosphere of the Remembrance Day celebrations makes it very hard to do that. Because you're like somebody showing up at somebody's funeral and you're sort of saying, yeah, you know, Joe was an okay guy, but yeah, have you read his thesis? He, you know, he forgot five footnotes and it was basically derivative work. And you know, Well, you wouldn't do that at a funeral. When you go to a funeral, you're supposed to say, great friend, great father, whatever, uh, wonderful person, light of my life. And then you can save your critical comments for after the funeral. Same thing with how they've treated around this, this religious atmosphere around Remembrance Day. It's almost impossible now to say any of this, right? And I'm not sure people should try and say it in the context of Remembrance Day services. Or, or I think it's, it, it needs a different approach. Uh, maybe a kind of counter day, you know, a, a really well-organized, powerful counter-Remembrance Day in which we say, well, this is, and not and not to affect people who lost their lives in the war. I mean, I'm writing this book about this kid who, very, very, you know, noble, altruistic, pure-minded Presbyterian boy from Ottawa who really wants to stand up for what's right and true in his books. I'm not about to say unkind, ungenerous things about him in my book. But I am also obliged as a historian to say, essentially, losing your life at Passchendaele was a tragic waste of your life. Uh, I can't put it, as an honest person, you can't put it any other way. And I wonder if there's room still for that kind of dialogue. I mean, I gave a lot of talks when the Femi celebration was happening, and we were really trying to oppose it. I gave some talks to legions around that. Um, on one or two of them, uh, an old, old legionnaire would stand up and challenge me to fight him. <laughs> yeah, 
wasn't about to do that. The guy was like 80 years old. And, you know, that would be, and I, anyway, I kind of liked him. He showed up and he was interested in the war. You know, I'm not the kind of person that would want to discredit him. And then another of those Legion talks, I was really struck by how open people were to hearing this other side of the war. And one of them came up to me and afterwards and said, we're so glad you gave us this talk because we're kind of, we've had it up to here with all of the romance around Vimy. All of this official story that we're almost indoctrinating our students to learn in high schools. I mean, you can spend half the year a high school history course in, high, in, in, high, in an Ontario high school reconstructing the trenches of the First World War with the implication being that is the meaning of Canada, the First World War. People who've had it up to here with this official story want to hear something more truthful. So I think there's an opening for people who are critical of war, critical of imperialism, critical of the, the horrors that we see being enacted every day in Gaza. There's room for people who have that critical perspective to enter into a dialogue with people who have been indoctrinated all their lives in this cult of war. Uh, it needs to be done respectfully and carefully, but I think there's real room there for, I would call it adult thinking about the war, uh, conscious thinking, just look at the world around you. Is it really better for the 90 million odd lives that were lost in the 20th century because of the deliberate actions of militarist states? Really? <laughs> I, I see a wor world on the edge of a, of a, of a precipice uh, and how are we going to really help people understand that world if not through really giving them the actual history of war and industrial civilization, not a pretend history. Well, it, that might not be popular uh, message in these uh, days uh, around Remembrance Day, but I think it is uh, absolutely essential that uh, we do try to uh, properly um, reflect on and describe uh, these different wars that are uh, commemorated. Thanks a lot for coming on uh, uh, Talking Foreign Policy, Ian. Thank you very much for having me, Eve.